They thought the fire would cover their crime. But one tiny clue, no bigger than a thumbtack, remained. And it held all the information needed to put a trio of cold-blooded killers behind bars. in 1991, the Camden, Tennessee Fire Department got a call about a house fire outside of town. But by the time the firefighters arrived, the home was completely engulfed in flames. Because it was in a rural area, they didn't even put it out. They just let it burn, and they left the scene. The homeowner was named Danny Vine. Since his truck was gone, firefighters assumed he wasn't in the house when the fire started. The truck was missing and the trailer, but Della Thornton, his fiance, her car was there, keys in ignition, and basically everyone just thought she pulled up, got into trouble with him, and they left. There was virtually nothing left of the two-bedroom frame home. The house was fairly small, 900 square feet to 1,000 square feet max, very small. Uh, total burnout. Uh, Nothing left but just the, uh, the plate that goes around where you nail the joist and part of the front porch. The next day, family members went through the rubble. Tragically, Danny's brothers found bones in the debris. The sheriff's department responded, law enforcement responded, because you, know, you find bones in a, uh, in a fire that definitely uh, ratchets up the investigation. Basically, there was nothing left. The, the, the bones were basically just powder, except the skull and the teeth. After careful analysis, a team of forensic anthropologists from the University of Tennessee concluded that the bones were from two people. Using dental records, they were identified as Danny and his girlfriend, Della Thornton. It just seemed like I was having a nightmare. I mean, it just seemed like it was a dream that I'd had. and that I would wake up, you know, because we live in a small town. Camden is a small rural area. Things like that just don't happen. 27-year-old Danny Vine was a professional scuba diver. He bought and sold mussel shells used to make mother of pearl jewelry and to seed cultured pearls. Basically, the mussel shell buyer at that time, it was a purely cash business. They would have to keep five or ten thousand dollars in cash on their person at all times to buy muscle shells danny from what i understand treated everybody right paid a fair price uh, if he told you something then that would be that would be the truth his fiance 29 year old della thornton was a factory worker their wedding date was only a few months away della she was a sweet girl she was uh, soft-spoken just kind of easy going pretty blonde with brown eyes. They went a good looking couple. Their remains were on the sofa in the living room, strongly suggesting either murder or murder-suicide. The reason that it's important is because if your house is burning, you're not gonna sit there on the couch and pop some popcorn and watch it burn while you're inside of it. You're gonna make some kind of an attempt to get out, if you're able to get out, if you're not injured, if you're not being bound by something. Investigators also found the remains of the couple's dog. Now, the only thing in the house that was consistent with a living thing was the puppy, from the position of the puppy was found huddled in the corner. A specially trained arson dog detected an accelerant. And investigators noticed what's known as a saddle burn near the front door. A yeah, saddle burn is what we refer to as a burn down. And it's where a flammable liquid has been poured and it runs in a downward direction, and that's the way that fire will burn. Gas chromatograph mass spectrometry of the ashes confirmed gasoline was used to start the fire. Investigators estimated that almost 10 gallons had been poured in the home and on the bodies. 
The fire took more than just the lives of Danny, Della, and their dog. It also destroyed potential evidence. A forensic anthropologist discovered that Danny Vine and Della Thornton weren't killed by the house fire. He found remnants of a bullet in Danny's skull. As a lead bullet enters the bone, the edges of the bullet are peeled off, and it begins to splatter. You get it splattering all over the inside of the skull, and you get these little tiny pinpoints that are dense in the X-ray won't go through that. That's why they're white or light on the x-ray film. The bullet was from a 38 caliber. He also found lead fragments in Della's skull. The theory at that point is it's murder because it was not a suicide because there was no 38 caliber pistol found in the house. Uh, there was a 45 Danny had, but there was no 38. And so whoever shot him left the scene. Um, and so at, the, at that point, we, had, we felt sure we had a murder. On a deserted road a few miles from Danny and Della's home, investigators found Danny's pickup truck. The trailer was attached, but was empty. Danny's friends gave police a possible motive for the murders. They'd seen $2,500 worth of muscle shells in Danny's trailer before his death. To a muscle diver, that trailer full of shells is a trailer full of money. We also found tracks where a vehicle had backed up to the trailer to unload off of Danny's trailer onto another vehicle. And once the truck is located and the shells are, are missing, uh, then our theory is that it's, that it's robbery. Unfortunately, there were no fingerprints. The truck had been wiped down. There were nobody's fingerprints, not even Danny Vines in that, in that truck. Danny bought muscle shells from independent scuba divers, then sold them to companies that made jewelry or used them to seed cultured pearls. So you can really say that most all the pearls of the world originate from right here on the scenic Tennessee River. But muscle shell divers had the reputation of being very tough characters. You have to be physically tough. You've got to be mentally tough to get down in that cold water, that dark water in the bottom of the Tennessee River and fill around with your hands in the mud and hope that you don't find something you don't need to. The bottom line is most of these muscle shell divers, some didn't, but a lot of the ones we dealt with in this case almost all had multiple felony convictions. Since the motive for the murders looked like robbery, investigators contacted every company that bought shells in the two weeks following the crime, and they got a break. One company said they were offered shells that looked suspicious. They had lost their water weight. After several days out of the water, the mussels would open up a little bit and let all the water drain out. And the shells are sold by the pound, and so they're not worth anywhere near as much once the water gets out. And the shells were damaged, as if they had already been through a shaker, a machine that separates them according to size. If a bunch of shells shows up at another shell buyer's camp with chips and marks and things on it, which indicates it's already been through a shaker, then that is going to be an indicator that either the shells are stolen, uh, well, pretty much the shells are stolen. Investigators learned that the person who sold these damaged shells was the wife of a local shell diver, Gary Bruce. Gary and his two brothers, Jerry Lee and Robert, all had prior arrests for numerous crimes. They often skirted the law through intimidation. I remember during an interview with a witness uh, in an undisclosed location, they blew up a building located behind where the interview was being conducted just to let the witness know, I can get to you anytime I want to. Well, one brother, J.C. Bruce, had uh, been convicted of rape, attempted murder, where he had raped a young girl and strangled her. He thought she was dead. And luckily, she survived to testify against him. He was out of prison at the time this happened. He had been pardoned by the governor a number of years earlier. When police interviewed the Bruce brothers, they denied any involvement in the murders and claimed they were elsewhere. They all came in, and their mother, Kathleen Bruce, came in and provided an alibi. So they were all on her property at a shed outside shooting pool at a pool table all night. For the moment, at least, the case appeared to be a dead end.
police were convinced that the three Bruce brothers had something to do with Danny Vine and Della Thornton's murder. But they faced a sizable hurdle. The Bruce brothers claimed to have an alibi that they were with their mother that night. So police dug a little deeper, and gradually, that alibi started to crack. They interviewed this woman who says, no, I was at the, the Bruce trailer that night with Kathleen Bruce, and none of the Bruces were there. According to a local businessman, the Bruce brothers were at a gas station that night, just hours before the fire at Danny Vine's home. The Bruce's pulled up and took out two five-gallon gas containers and filled those up with gasoline. One of the brothers told the store owner that there's going to be a hot time in Camden tonight. Uh, and again, we felt like that that was involving the fire. But this information alone wasn't enough. We had an alibi that wouldn't hold up, but we still couldn't put them on the scene at the time. We've got a lot of rumor, a lot of innuendo. We've got people that are saying that they're in one place, but they're really someplace else. So investigators turned to the only hard evidence they had, the burned remains of the victims. And here, the forensic anthropologist provided some useful information. Burn patterns indicated that Danny Vine fell forward on the sofa after he was shot. This was a lucky break in this investigation because uh, it just happens that where the bullet was, was the least burned part of the body. The intensity of the fire was not as great on the front of the skull as it was on the back. The lead inside the bullet had melted, but the bullet's copper jacket peeled away after hitting the bone, and it was not destroyed. Copper has a melting point of somewhere near 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the lead core, which would have been the center portion of the bullet, it had a melting point of somewhere near 600 degrees Fahrenheit. On the copper jacket of the bullet were rifling characteristics that could identify the weapon that fired it. But the Bruce's denied owning a 38 caliber pistol. All we have is a bullet, and we don't have a gun to match it back to. But then a witness came forward who said she was at Gary Bruce's home one day when he was target shooting. She says that at some point he stopped, took a pistol out that he had. Yeah, I think it was a revolver, a 38 revolver. And took a couple shots at a tree over there. The woman took investigators to Gary Bruce's home and found the tree. Sure enough, investigators found a bullet hole. So they cut down the tree to look inside. The puzzle was beginning to take form now and take shape. Uh, and we felt like that was a crucial piece of evidence uh, in, in this case. Investigators used a hammer and chisel to gain access to the bullet without damaging it. When they finally got to it, they saw that it was just as the witness described a 38 caliber round. Both the bullet from the tree and from Danny Vine's skull were sent to ballistics expert Tommy Heflin. In most firearms, the series of spirals that are cut or pressed into the barrel at a twist, either right or left, that gives the bullet its rotational spin to give it its accuracy to its target. Even though both bullets had sustained significant damage, Heflin was able to compare the striations on both bullets and discovered that the lands and grooves lined up perfectly. It was very high quality. I was 100% certainty it was the same gun. We never found the gun, but we could prove it was Gary Bruce's gun through the circumstantial evidence, and it, it was critical evidence. Because of it, uh, it we were able to determine what gun it came from and who it belonged to. Thanks to a stray bullet in a tree, the Bruce brothers were arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. But bringing the brothers to trial wouldn't be easy. 
When Carol Vine heard the Bruce brothers had been arrested for the murder of her son, Danny, and future daughter-in-law, Della, she turned pale. That's because Della told her she'd been approached by Jerry Lee Bruce shortly before her murder. Jerry had tried to get her to go out with him during the time that, you know, before that, not too long before that. And she told him no, and she said, you'll never be half the man that Danny is. And so I think that's why he wanted to, to shoot her, to kill her. Prosecutors say the primary motive was robbery. This was wintertime, too cold for the Bruce brothers to dive for shells in the icy Tennessee waters. So they decided to steal shells instead. On the night of the murder, witnesses placed the three Bruce brothers at a local gas station, filling plastic containers with gasoline. Gary Bruce told the owner it was going to be a hot night in Camden. Prosecutors believe that the Bruce brothers robbed Danny Vine of any cash he had on hand and fully intended to kill him. During the robbery, Della drove up to the house and saw the Bruce's truck. She knew there was trouble. She went inside to help, and the Bruce's shot them both with a 38 caliber pistol. Chemical tests prove they poured gasoline throughout the house and set the fire. The position of Danny's head protected the copper jacket of the bullet from melting. This tiny fragment tied the Bruce's to the murder. The brothers drove Danny's truck to a deserted location and took Danny's muscle shells worth approximately $2,500. They wiped their fingerprints off the truck, but they made a huge blunder with the shells. They either didn't know or perhaps didn't care that Danny had already put these shells through a shaker to determine their value. When Gary Bruce's wife tried to sell the shells, the buyer knew right away that the shells had been stolen. The shell business is a multi-million dollar business. A lot of people uh, buy shells uh, Ill illegally, uh, uh, and, and sometimes they don't question it, where they come from. It's just, uh, uh, but they have to have a receipt. You, ha you have to get receipts down. Uh, and in this case, we were able to track the receipts down where the Bruce had, Bruce's had sold these shells up in, uh, up in Perrier, Tennessee. As the brothers awaited trial, Gary Bruce peeled back part of a chain link fence in the prison recreation yard and escaped. We had a lot of trouble trying to find him. We searched on horseback, we searched in the water, we helicopters, we had agents from all kinds of, uh, of departments everywhere. For 14 months, Gary Bruce eluded police. He even made the FBI's 10 most wanted list. But thanks to an anonymous tip, he was finally apprehended 200 miles away in Nashville, Tennessee, working as a landscaper. <laughs> Gary, Jerry Lee, and Robert Bruce were all tried and convicted of two counts of first-degree murder, arson, firearms violations, and conspiracy to obstruct justice. Each was sentenced to life in prison without parole. They were doing that to get money, but it took my child, the Thornton's daughter, it took any future grandchildren that we could have had. 
Kathleen Bruce, the boy's 60-year-old mother, was convicted for providing her sons with a false alibi and was sentenced to eight years in prison. I don't think they anticipated all that they got, but the fact is that they, they got all they deserved. A lot of people were, were very happy. Uh, it lowered the crime rate significantly in Benton County and the area. In the end, the Bruce brothers were no match for the power of forensic science. I think that we're very lucky in this case, in that mainly people, when they set a house on fire, think it's going to destroy everything. Well, it doesn't. There's always evidence there. Uh, and in this case, there was quite a lot of evidence. The forensics in this case was absolutely critical, but for the ballistics, uh, but for the forensic of cause and origin for the arson case, there would not have been much of a case.